Francis Ngannou is delivering the biggest boxing con ever. Let's get into it. Hello, welcome to Omnia Sun. I hope you're well. If you like what I do here, don't forget to like and share the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notifications bell for all future videos. So, we are now in the throes of the latest big boxing event, uh, Francis Ngannou against Anthony Joshua. And we're having the press conferences now, and all is going to be revealed. The undercard is going to be revealed. And all this comes after the I would call it an exhibition fight, but it was a competitive fight in, in, in certain regards, but there was nothing on the line. There were no bouts or anything on the line between Francis Ngannou, former UFC uh, heavyweight champion, and uh, and the lineal and uh, WBC heavyweight champion that is uh, Tyson Fury. They had a fight back in October, very close. Many people thought Ngannou won. I didn't, but I thought it was a very close fight, and uh, Ngannou came out with it with a lot of uh, with a lot of pluses. You know, t nobody was expecting that he could fight like that, and nobody expected Tyson Fury to be so poor as well. But regardless, no matter what people say in the comments uh, that Ngannou won and everything like that, no, he didn't. He lost. What I talk about is facts. The facts are which many people claim in the comments as well, saying, oh, this is facts, when you're just making a prediction, when you're giving opinions. Okay, no, opinions and predictions are not facts. They are just that, opinions and predictions. A fact is that Tyson Fury beat Francis Ngannou. Whether you agree with that result or not is irrelevant. It's just like me saying, my team, we go and uh, play another team at football and uh, we lose 2-1, but we were all over them and we should have scored five or six goals. We could have won, we should have won, but we didn't. That's the same here. Francis Ngannou did not beat Tyson Fury by the results. Therefore, what gives him the credentials to get another huge boxing match? Okay, he fought very well. But I've already remarked on what I thought his weaknesses were and also, you know, coming up against another fighter who was ready for him and also they'd seen what he, how he could fight. They would say, well, I, I think this is a quite an easy uh, win for another fighter. I think if Tyson Fury comes in against Ngannou again, I think he beats him really easily this time because you'd know how to do it. Now, I'm not saying he would knock him out. I'm not saying uh, he would uh, destroy him or anything like that. What I'm saying is in the sport of boxing, he would beat him convincingly, even if it's by points. He would just have to outsmart him in the boxing sense, and he would completely beat him. And it'd be exactly the same for Anthony Joshua or any other decent heavyweights as well out there. In my opinion, they would quite easily beat Francis Ngannou. Now, that doesn't mean to say that they will, or, you know, he can't get better, and he can't shock the world again, and he isn't a dangerous fighter. Of course he, he is. Of course he is. But I'm saying is, does he deserve to fight Antonio Joshua after losing to Tyson Fury in a non-competitive fight? So this is where I have a bit of an issue with this whole this whole theatre that's uh, developing. Francis Ngannou went on the Ariel Hawani show, and he's basically asked, you know, do you really want to fight for the bouts? Do you really want to? I, I'm paraphrasing here, but essentially. Francis Garner said, well, no, I'm not really interested in the politics. I'm not really interested in the bouts. You know, if one was on the line, maybe. But, you know... That tells everything to me. He doesn't care about boxing. He doesn't care about titles. He doesn't care about trying to beat opponents to get his ranking up from a 10 or a 15 or a 10 in the WBC and to get other governing body rankings as well, to get up to a 1-2, to get him into a contender position. No, all he's interested is the big money fights. That's all he wants. So he's not interested in boxing. He just wants a big money fight. So you say, okay, fine, he's a prize fighter, right? That's what he wants. But boxing is letting itself down by allowing this to happen. Now, I've said in a previous video, what's in this for AJ? I don't think there's anything in this for AJ. I think there's a lot of jeopardy in this for AJ. And if AJ gets beaten by Ngannou, fair play to Ngannou, but this would be the end of AJ. You have no credibility left. If Ngannou loses to AJ, then for me, he's 0 for 2. He is definitely finished in boxing or top level boxing. But on the Aero Hawani show, Ngannou said, no, no, after AJ, I'm fighting Tyson Fury. He was adamant, no, this is going to happen. We have a two-fight deal already in place. So what the hell is going on? He doesn't really respect boxing. I don't think he really cares about winning titles or anything. He's only there for the money. That's what he's there for, the money. That's a terrible impression, I know, but it's, it's the money. That's all he's after. I'm oh, fine. Okay, if that's what he's after, that, that's what he's after. But it doesn't mean that he has to be allowed to do it. 
And I say this is the biggest con because it goes against all the principles of what boxing should be. Yes, boxing is a business. Yes, all the the horrible things that you could say about boxing, you could actually label against the UFC and all the problems that they have as well. When we're talking about, oh, UFC is so much better than boxing in terms of fighters fighting the best. Well, if that was the case, then John Jones would be fighting Tom Aspel now, or, or Stipe Miocic would be fighting Tom Aspel now until John Jones gets better again. That's the kind of level that we're talking about. Or they just strip John Jones of the title, give it to uh, Tom Aspinall. He defends his title over and over again until uh, John Jones comes back and then they can have a dust up together. But there's absurdity there as well, isn't there? So we've got the same absurdity, whether it's in UFC or in boxing. But here in a crossover event where Francis Garner has come over and he's basically come just to grab the cash, grab the cash and run. He's 38 years old. He's only going to go downhill over the next couple of years. So in his mind, he can't afford, and I've said this before as well, he can't afford to have loads of tune-up fights just to build up his ranking. He knows in himself that he has to go for the big money fights and his name is bringing him forward. His name is bringing him into the equation and only because... He had a really good display against Tyson Fury in a nothing fight, really. But, yes, whether you think it was competitive or not, yeah. Look, do I think Francis Ngannou had Tyson Fury? I think he did. You know, it was very, very close. You know, he certainly knocked him down and he certainly had the better aggression in there in the early rounds. But then Tyson Fury worked him out. Now, whether you agree with that or not, that's what the judges saw. <laughs> Basically, that's all that matters, really, in terms of the result. So, Francis Garner, zero for one. Now he's got a big money fight against AJ. Regardless of the outcome of that, he thinks in his mind, I think he's a little naive here from Francis Garner, he thinks he's definitely going for uh, Tyson Fury again. I don't think anybody would want to watch it. We already talked about the pay-per-view sales of the Fury against Ngannou first fight, and it's only because the sound is a bankroll in it, just as a bankroll in this, that people are going to be willing to pay for it. Why would anybody want to really pay for the AJ and Garner fight? Yeah, okay, two big hitters. I suppose you're gonna you're gonna pay for that. Now, if Deontay Wilder had beat Joseph Parker convincingly, AJ Deontay Wilder, that's a big pay per view fight. That is a one that would work in the United States. That would work around the world as well. The other big problem with this pay-per-view of Nganu against uh, AJ is that it's being held on a Friday night in Saudi Arabia. This is to do with the end of the Riyadh season and the beginning of Ramadan as well. But the problem is that that means that the fight will happen in the United States, certainly on the West Coast, mid to late morning on a work day. Everybody's going to be at work. Nobody's going to be watching it. So the pay-per-views are likely to bomb in the United States at least. In Canada, at least. Actually, anywhere in the Americas, it's going to bomb, isn't it? In the other parts of the world, certainly around Europe and in Africa, and all around the same sort of time zone, yeah, it's going to do very well. But everywhere else, it'll probably get a poor sales. And the only reason it's happening is because the Saudi is a bankroll in it. The only reason Francis Ngannou is in there, because he knows the Saudi will pay for it. If the Saudis weren't paying for it, he knows that no other promoter is going to touch him. Everybody's on the take here. Everybody knows that this is a big opportunity to earn lots and lots of money in a very short time period. But I just don't think he warrants that kind of exposure or certainly that kind of challenge. Certainly against Tyson Fury, I didn't think he warranted it. And uh, certainly against AJ, he doesn't. So let's just say he gets beaten by AJ, then he's finished. But oh no. What, just because, let's, let's just say he puts on another decent display against AJ, but ultimately he loses. So that does that mean he still gets another shot at Tyson Fury? Does that mean we can set up a big money fight against Deontay Wilder? It's a bit, it's a bit of a nonsense. I said after the first video, I said, you know, the first fight was a novelty. It's a crossover. Okay, fine. Let's have our bit of fun with it. I didn't necessarily think it was a great matchup or a great idea, but there we go. We all wanted the Tyson Fury Usyk fight. We've got that fight now. You know, that's what we really wanted to see. This is a bit of a distraction, but I thought once is enough. Why do we have to keep on doing it? AJ at the time said, "No, I'm not interested in gimmick fights." And I said this in the last video as well. But all of a sudden now. 
I think this is more of an Eddie Hearn thing who will say, no, let's let's get involved in this. We can earn loads and loads of money because the Saudis are willing to pay you for it, AJ. Let's do it. It brings you front and centre. And so I said this in the, in the last video as well. This propels AJ into the front seat again, into the consciousness of all the boxing fans and the boxing socials and MMA fans and MMA socials uh, around the world. This This is what it does. This is what it does. It propels both of them into the limelight. It keeps the conversation going. I'm just not sure it's a conversation that's worth having. I'm not sure it's merited. I don't think Francis Ngannou deserves it. That's the thing. I just don't think he deserves it. Just because he came from another discipline, mixed martial arts, into boxing, and did reasonably well, or very well, in fact. Let's not mix our words here. He did very, very well against Tyson Fury, who really underperformed. But I said from the third or fourth round, fourth, fourth, fifth round, Francis Ngannou was spent. He was spent. He was totally gassed out. And yes, that's the reason why Tyson Fury could could uh, carry on and mass up the points thereafter. Last couple of rounds, it was a crap fight anyway. Nothing was really happening. But what is true, if Francis Ngannou worked on his gas tank a lot more, worked on his strength and conditioning and you know his his stamina, He'll be a very serious threat for AJ and also a Tyson Fury as well. So from that point of view, you've got to see how this fight develops. Yes, granted. But do I think on the basis of that fight that he deserves another top level fight? No. Now, on the strength of that Tyson Fury performance, do I think that he should be in the ring with a with a Joseph Parker, with a, with a Otto Wallin, with a, with a Zhili Zhang, with a, with a Dubois? Do I think he should be in that kind of uh, arena? Yes, I do. Any of the top 10 fighters, you can say, well, okay, the WBC have handed you a top 10 ranking. Fine. Let's fight some of those uh, lower tier top 10 fighters. Fine. Prove yourself there. Let's see what you really got now. Then you can come back to the big table. But he's kind of leapfrogged that. Let us know what you think in the comments below. But uh, Francis Ngannou, is this the biggest boxing con? I'm not sure if it's by his hands, but I think the system is allowing it to be. And I think the only people who have been taken for a ride, really, are the people who are willing to pay for it. Let us know your thoughts. If you like what I do here, don't forget to like and share the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notifications bell for all future videos. And I'll catch you again. Bye now. The Great British Post Office Scandal. Is it a swindle? Let's get into it. Hello, welcome to the Alf Gasparo channel. I hope you're all well. If you like what I do here, don't forget to like and share the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notifications bell for all future videos. So, the biggest scandal to come out of uh, UK for 2024 is a very old scandal that started in 2009 and ran up to 2015 where post office sub postmasters, uh, the guys who run the post office basically, the head honchos, and this could be a little corner shop uh, somewhere or somewhere a little bit bigger, all over the country, over 900 of them, over a period from 2009 2015, were accused of theft. So they're basically, the uh, they were accused by the post office, by the Royal Mail, of actually stealing uh, funds from the Royal Mail and basically from the the government and also from you and I. So essentially, what happened was that all these hundreds of people were accused, and it went through the court system. And they're all convicted, loads were convicted, and, uh, you know, their livelihoods lost, their reputations besmirched in the community, their lives were a living hell. So they've all banded together over the years to try and prove their innocence and say, no, it's just got nothing to do with us. And these are all unrelated people, they don't know each other, but they've all been accused of this crime, right? So what happened was in 2019, after grouping together and uh, launching their own defence, which cost millions and millions and millions and millions, the High Court in the UK said, no, actually, the system, the accounting system that the post office was using was to blame. There was nothing wrong with these people. They hadn't done anything wrong. 
So in the meantime, what's been happening, that certain people have been exonerated. They've, uh, their convictions have been quashed. They've been allowed to uh, return to society, as it were. But the problem is that all these people who have uh, defended themselves have spent millions. The compensation that they got was just a few million more as a group. So essentially, individually, they've got about £20,000 worth of, of uh, compensation of pain, suffering, anguish, and being accused of a crime that they didn't commit. How did they find out that this software, this accounting software, was to blame? Well, essentially, it was the defendants, again, the, the people who were all accused, the submasters, the postmasters who were accused, they all got together and then they put pressure on to have an independent inquiry to to investigate this software and then the software inquiry yeah said yeah this actual software is to blame it, it will cause all these errors so here's my question here's my point and this is an indictment on the legal system but also on commentators on the media and also on the post office themselves how is it that over 900 people hundreds and hundreds of people from all over the uk have been accused of the same crime, but they don't know each other. And how is it that this amount of people were accused of this crime when this number of people were never accused of this crime in the past? How is that possible? Surely there should be some red flags coming up. It's what we call in, in an industry that I'm a part of as a sanity check, an idiot check. You've got all this overwhelming evidence against a group of people and you've got to say, well, hold on a minute. Let's just play devil's advocate here. What the hell is going on? Nobody seems to have done it. Not in the legal process when they were being prosecuted, not within the post office themselves and certainly not within the media or, or any other body to say, well, actually, hold on. What is going on? Let's have a sanity check here. We can't have hundreds and hundreds of unrelated people who don't really know each other. They just work for the same organization, but they're all being accused of the same crime. What's the common denominator? It's the organization. What is the crime that they've all been accused of? It's theft. How has this theft been unearthed? Well, it's because of the accounting software that we use has shown that it's uh, uh, there has been theft. So hold on a minute. So you've got all these people who have accused of the same crime in the same kind of time period, and the common denominator is the same employer using the same accounting software that triggers the alarm. Why not investigate the system? They should have investigated the system right at the very start. Now, the reason why this has become big news again here in the UK is because there's actually been a, a dramatization of this event. There's a dramatization that as a four part series, I believe, that's kind of kick started the government to look into this and say, oh, yeah, well, we're going to give compensation and we're going to overturn all these convictions. So I say, well, hold on a minute. Why does it take since 2019? to now, four years later, for the government to suddenly respond and say, we're going to quash your convictions. These convictions should have been quashed a long time ago. Why is it taken until now for the government to say, well, we're going to look at the compensation of these people? No, that should have been done years and years ago. Now, this is going to be of little relief or compensation to the families of those, I believe, four tragic individuals who, because of the stress and everything else that was going on, committed suicide. I mean, what kind of a system do we have where the legal system is not taking ownership of this, the government not taking ownership of this, the media who reported on it are not taking any kind of ownership on it, and certainly not the post office. Now, the head of the post office, who was made a CBE, uh, I believe, uh, at the time, now she has handed that back in. So she's uh, no longer taking credit for her time in the post office. Well, quite rightly so. Any CEO of a company is legally responsible for what happens in that company, like directors are as well. So surely, shouldn't there be some kind of criminal investigation here into the post office? I believe, I believe the police are investigating this as well. They're investigating whether there is any kind of fraudulent activity within the post office themselves. Now, it could be that it was just a system, this accounting software that was developed by Fujitsu, I believe, for a Japanese uh, corporation, uh, 
basically it could just be a simple issue with that system there was no intention there it was just a glitch and nobody knew about it look you don't know what you don't know so therefore yes okay it could be a legitimate error that caused all these issues but the question i have is why did it take so long for anybody to raise a red flag why did it take so long for the legal system or any kind of reaction from the authorities to say hold on a minute what is going on this is the probably the biggest scandal certainly of this year so far but certainly such a long-running scandal where so many people have had their lives turned upside down the post office have been irreparably damaged themselves in terms of reputation i mean why would you ever want to work for an organization like that if this is how they treat you and i remember this story clearly at the time you know lots of people saying what is going on but if the public can smell a rat, if independent commentators can smell a rat, why can't the official investigators can smell a rat? Why can't the police? The police also are part, you know, the investigation. Surely they should be smelling a rat as well. There's something not quite right here. I would not be surprised if the police find some kind of wrongdoing within the post office during this whole time frame where maybe people have been raising a red flag, but it's been batted away. They said, no, no, just, just carry on. No, there's nothing wrong with our system. I would not be surprised if that comes out. L listen, I mean, this is the biggest scandal. You know, my heart goes out to anybody who's, who's accused of this because regardless of what the outcome is, regardless if their conviction is quashed, hey, mud sticks and your reputation is forever been blemished let's say but these are years that these people will never get back and it's their families and their friends they will never get back because of what has been caused by a, a software issue but more importantly the human error in so many different departments so many different areas that is allowed people to think that actually this is right there's, there's nothing wrong with this conviction. There is nothing wrong with this accusation. Surely, people should be raising questions a lot more. And, they and this is why they've been so vehement in their defense all these years to say, it wasn't us. It wasn't us. And that's why they had to defend themselves. Even though it was, in many cases, it was only a few thousand pounds, they had to defend themselves because it's about reputation. You've been accused and you've got a criminal conviction now for something you just didn't do. Shame on the post office, shame on the government, shame on everybody who was involved at this, and, you know, at any kind of level to have let this happen, but especially the legal system as well, for just not opening your eyes and seeing the wood through the trees a little bit. All this needed was a sanity check right at the very start. What a scandal. What a swindle. Let us know your thoughts, and I'll catch you again on another video coming very soon. Bye now. Harley Davidson are about to launch their models of 2024. Are we excited about it? Do we even care? Do we expect them to deliver more than they have done in the past? <laughs> Let's get into this one. Hello, welcome to Revelate Alpha. I hope you're all well. If you like what I do here, don't forget to like and share the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notifications bell for all future videos. So, Harley Davidson, yes, they're bringing out their models for 2024, their products, their motorcycle products for 2024. And uh, on January 24th, and yes, we're all waiting with bated breath. Now, I've kind of been a critic of Harley Davidson in the past for not doing their autumn reveals of motorcycles anymore. They shifted it to January. But I also said, every year I say, it, actually, it's a bit of a marketing masterstroke where I can say, well, actually, in January, we're not talking about any other motorcycle manufacturer. We're just talking about Harley Davidson and what they're going to bring out, right? Especially kind of online commentators like me. So, what can we expect? Well, the 2024 bikes, the carryover bikes, have already been brought out. We know there are different colors. Great. And people aren't really enthusiastic about those. People are certainly not enthusiastic about the rise in prices. So why would you go and spend uh, extra money on a 2024 bike that's exactly the same as a 2023 bike? Why would you do it? I'm not sure it's worth it, unless you, unless all you're after is the brand new registration. When you get a brand new 2023 bike that's just been uh, not been sold, you can also get a nearly new or used uh, 2023 bike, 2022 bike with, let's say, a 500 miles and a 1,000 miles, which is exactly the same. And you'll save yourself a pretty penny as well. So there's, there's a kind of people a little bit muted about what has been 
delivered so far the 2024 lineup a lot of people are saying online and a lot of youtube channels are saying 2024 lineup but where are the tourers well we know the tourers the street glide special road glide special and all those kinds of bikes well they're not coming out we know they're not coming out now because there's going to be changes and that's what's going to be announced in the january 24th launch right i think probably going to get different fairings just like the cvos we're probably going to get the infotainment system just like the cvos as well potentially who knows but if you watch other videos, and I've been getting messages as well about this, and I think a Million Dollar Bogan did a, a video about the CVO recently, where he's saying, look, hey, it's got it's got really big electronics problems, you know, with the sat-navs and how it hooks up to your phone and the, how long it takes to start the bike and all this kind of stuff. And I think there's a few other issues as well. I haven't had a good look at the video, but go check it out. I'm sure you'll enjoy it as well. But the, the point is... If you've got to buy this CVO that costs a huge amount of money and you bring it to market, it's still got lots of issues. And we know this with first year model bikes. My advice is don't buy them. Wait a year, wait a couple of years until they've ironed out all the wrinkles. Then you go and buy the bike. But that's another issue, right? You got a bike, you bought it to market. Now you're going to take that same technology and apply it to the Taurus for 2024. Well, maybe the maybe that same issue is going to then transfer over to all the tourers and you're going to have a 2024 bike if you're buying a street glide or a road glide and you're going to have a whole year full of woe and headaches because it's always going to have these same issues now it may not be of course it may be perfectly fine but we just don't know that but you, all you can go on is what's happened with some of the cvos so far and what potentially could happen for 2024 we don't know if any other bikes are going to be sold by harley davidson any brand new models we hope maybe that another revolution max bike will come out we've seen the sort of trailer the teaser of a new bikes that are coming out yeah we know there's two uh, tourers in there those tourers have got the cvo fairing on there so yeah fine that's uh, coming out but what was the bike in the background? Is it a soft tail? Is it, is it another kind of touring bike? Is it uh, a Revolution Max bike? Are there any other bikes that are going to come out? Are they going to bring out enthusiasts, icon bikes? All this is yet to be answered. And we don't know. And that's the beauty of a model launch. We don't know until it actually happens. And we certainly don't know what we don't know. So therefore, all this is speculation. But what I wanted to talk about in this video was really about, well, is anybody expecting it to be any better than it has been in the, in the, in the last few years? Is anybody expecting it to be amazing, an amazing reveal? I just don't think it's going to... I think it'll be good, but I just don't think it'll be amazing. And I think that's the problem here. I've just got a notification from Indian Motorcycles. They've, they've just opened up a dealership, which I wasn't aware of, you know. So there we go. That just goes to show uh, how much of my finger is on the pulse. They've just opened up a dealership right down the road from where I am in direct competition with Harley Davidson, who were just up the road as well. Coincidentally, that's where I got my Harley from. They're inviting me to go around there and have a look. Now, I'm not saying that Harley Davidson dropped the ball. I'm certainly not saying that Indian have uh, uh, or gaining ground on Harley Davidson, all the likes of BMW or Triumph, which I believe they are. But, you know, that's a separate issue as well. But what I say is that that Indian, if we just take Indian, They've got much more of an arsenal, a much more of a product lineup that will attract a broader range of rider. And riders who are maybe just want to get into the cruiser lineup and want to get up into the, um, the, the touring lineup as well, possibly they deliver a little bit better. I'm not saying they're better on price, certainly because Indians are expensive as well. But they may just appeal to a broader range, especially with the FTRs as well. And those smaller bikes, let's say like the Scout, that they have that Harley-Davidson have kind of done away with. Now, obviously, Harley-Davidson have got the Revolution Max engine, but they need to develop those bikes a lot more. And I've been saying this time and time again. This is your new engine platform. You really need to push the bikes with it. And they haven't really done it, really. They've got the Knights, the Knights Rest. They've got the, the uh, Sports Rest, which I kind of think a bit flops, really. But then, you know, you've this is certainly outside of the United States, of course, I'm talking about. I'm sure in the United States, they're, they're, they're reasonable sellers. But obviously, the biggest seller has been the Pan America, right? And certainly for the United States. But have they been delivering anything that you can think, wow, I want to spend X, Y, Z money on that bike? Bearing in mind, this year they brought out the 2024 bikes already. They're even more expensive. We know the new bikes that are going to bring out, all the updated bikes, whether in the tour or a brand new bike, are going to be expensive. We know that. Okay, you know, we don't have to be rocket scientists to work that out. So why would people spend even more money on a product that they 
not even that enthusiastic about or th or question whether uh, whether it's even got the workmanship on it anymore. It used to be, oh, it's an American motorcycle manufacturer, these American motorcycles built in America, all that kind of stuff made in America. They can't say that now. Nobody can say that now. Even if you claim that, nobody can say that now because all manufacturers, they might assemble in a particular country, but it doesn't mean that all the parts come from that uh, that country. In fact, Harley Davidson, we know, source their parts all over the world. In fact, many of their motorcycles are not even made in America. They're made in Thailand, Brazil, India, China. They're made all over the place. And those bikes are shipped out to other parts of the world. It's only the bikes in America and Canada that are made in the United States. Or they are assembled in the United States. So you, you want Harley Davidson to have higher workmanship, higher craftsmanship, better motorcycles. They're all metal, no plastic, all that kind of stuff. But we know that the technology that, they, that they're using on their bikes, well, it, it's flawed at times. It's flawed at times. This has been demonstrated with the CVOs. They've got lots of glitches on those bikes. Apparently, I don't know this firsthand, but apparently. And there's lots of other motorcycles that they've had issues as well. Now, that's the same for all manufacturers, right? But other manufacturers are not charging you uh, a mortgage just to get a motorcycle, whereas Harley-Davidson are. Now, Harley-Davidson are. They're probably aiming at an audience that is more affluent, that's more cash-rich, older, more stable in life, so they can afford the, the, the bigger motorcycles, more expensive motorcycles. But that doesn't make them better buyers. And possibly, this is why there's been a, a muted response since January the 1st, where we've seen these new motorcycles come in with their new colours and their higher price tags, apart from the Nightsters, of course, in the United States. But here in the UK, it's still 14 and so thousand pounds for a Nightster, you know, Nightster special, I believe, which is really expensive. So, what do we think? What do we think? Are they are they going to make it a, a better experience for Harley Davidson owners this year? Are they going to produce better bikes? Are they going to make them less expensive? I can't say they are. So where does that leave the market? Where does that leave people like you and I and other prospective buyers? We're possibly pondering whether they want to either stick with the Harley Davidson they've got, buy a used motorcycle, or maybe just leave the brand. And that's the problem. The problem is that Harley Davidson might be going down a one-way street that they can't, uh, can't, they can't do a U-turn from. They can't get out this mindset of just bringing on new motorcycles that cost more and more money as opposed to trying to take a backward step a little bit in many ways or reverse gear a little bit and say, hey, actually, you know what? What we need to do is change the way we build bikes. Now, the teaser video that they produce is like motorcycles for a new era. Maybe this is it. Maybe this is what we're talking about. Maybe they are going to start a new era, a new style of motorcycles, a new price points attracting new types of riders looking to the new generation maybe that's it and maybe this is what we've got, all got to look forward to maybe this is what we should be expecting harley davidson will be doing something completely different this year who knows who knows but i'll tell you what i'll be waiting i'll be waiting with bated breath to see what harley davidson do on january 24th and will it be the big reveal that we hope it would be i'm just not sure that it will let us know your thoughts in the comments below if you like what i do here don't forget to like and share the video subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell for all future videos and i'll catch you again on another video coming very soon bye now